Hello. Okay, much of the work that we do at the uh, Historic Preservation Commission is associated with uh, review of construction projects. Uh, the purpose of these reviews is to um, identify um, cultural resources, meaning um, important Native American or historic resources um, that may be threatened by those construction projects that um, are at least partially funded with uh, federal monies. In 2009, we received notification from the Department of Transportation that the bridge over uh, the Kennebec River between Dresden and Richmond uh, was nearing the end of its use life and um, they were planning to build a new bridge and uh, wanted to know um, if there was a possibility of cultural resources that would be affected with this project or by this project. Um, this is just a um, 50s era map uh, showing the location of the bridge on the Kennebec River, the north end of Swan Island, and uh, the town of Richmond in the foreground. In conducting archaeological surveys, obviously a fair bit of our time initially is involved with trying to find out about the history of the site. Much of what we know about the site was actually um, researched in 1893 uh, by the Reverend Henry O'Fair. Uh, he was an excellent um, late 19th century historian. And so what I'm going to run through very quickly is uh, uh, what he uh, documented for the history of the site, and then, then we, we go from there. So the earliest historic occupation um, is Alexander Thwaite, um, hence the name uh, Thwaites Point. Um, he's there as early as 1649. Um, by 1714, a group of men out of Boston, known as the Pajapscot Proprietors, um, obtained control of a large portion of the land on either side of the river. Okay, the fort itself, what we know of that. Um, one of the reasons for constructing this fort was the establishment of a trading post uh, that would not only provide um, goods for potential settlers, but would also serve as a means of engendering good relations with uh, local, local Native Americans. By 1740, due to the threat of war with Spain, um, the uh, general court decides to upgrade its coastal defenses, including Fort Richmond. They essentially take down the old fort um, and uh, reconstruct the fort and make it larger. Historically, I mean, more recent historians and archaeologists haven't known exactly where the fort was located um, and also the two different forts. There were hypotheses that the, the first fort may have been upriver or downriver. It was fairly well agreed that the later fort was um, in the general location of Thwaites Point. Okay, the fort is taken down, decommissioned in 1755. Um, one of our questions was, what does decommissioning mean? At that time, they left up the chapel and at least one building uh, because um, Jacob Bailey um, actually lived there with his wife for a brief period of time. Um, then no one seems to be in the area um, until about 1775 to 76 when John Parks um, <coughs> builds a large fort in the, a large house in the fort and also his family establishes the ferry, which was um, running almost until the uh, 1930 bridge was put in place. Um, this is the site of the ferry landing. <clears throat> um, by 1930, um, DOT is building the new bridge. This is approximately what it looks like today. Just to um, point out the area on the south side, as many of you know, of, uh, is a park owned by the Department of Transportation. Uh, what we know visually of the fort, what it looked like, is practically nothing. Um, this is from a 1930s era travel brochure, a conjectural view. Um, this is another conjectural view uh, from uh, the late 19th century from a Boston historian. Um, one of the things that we are blessed with with this project <coughs> is the uh, ledger book of John Minot. John Minot was the uh, truck master or head of the trading post at the fort. Um, a, an article was written about this document, uh, which is at the uh, Maine Historical Society back in the 1980s. Um, we went down to look at it to get a sense of what kind of information was in it. Um, it's an unbelievable document. It, it um, details um, individual items um, that were purchased um, by um, uh, different uh, uh, pe people who were associated with the fort, including Native Americans. Um, talks about different tasks that people were doing. There are accounts for uh, bills billing the province of Massachusetts for construction supplies to give us evidence of 
uh, what kind of work was being done at the fort construction-wise. Um, what was <coughs> kind of unique about this is that Fred Kerber, um, a past um, history professor, history teacher at Brunswick High School, um, offered to do some research, help us with some research, uh, looking at the Pajepscot records at uh, Pajepscot Historical Society. So he, he um, emailed me and said he's, he's really enjoying going through the Minot Journal. And so we, we talked and I said, um, is, it, do you, is it a copy, copy of the Minot Journal? Because the original's at Maine Historical. And he said, oh no, this is an original document. <coughs> um, so I said, well that's funny, well, but what years is it? Uh, 1731 to 1737. Well, the uh, document at Maine Historical is 1737 to 1742. It turns out um, that uh, the Bajefscott Society, Society has Ledger A, uh, Maine Historical has Ledger B. There are references from Ledger A to Ledger B. It's a continuation of the accounts carried forward. Neither institution knew of the existence of the other. I'm, a little spot over here on one of our shovel test pits going down about two feet hit a small stain right in the corner of the shovel test pit. This is actually, um, the shovel test pit was right up here. It just hit one, one little edge here. And what we ha actually have is a section of the Palisade Trench uh, for the fort with the Im impressions of three posts with spaces between them. Um, this was extremely exciting because if, when you're looking for, for a fort um, that had a palisade uh, around it. And once we find the palisade, then you're golden because in theory, everything should be inside of that. Um, we found a corner. Those are um, the different post impressions that were in the corner of the palisade. So at this point, we have a corner and part of that palisade is facing right up toward the um, Adams's house. So we went across the road, um, dug a trench, lined up a tape as best we could. Lo and behold, we have a section of the palisade right in the trench. We continued further past the house, up onto the hill, um, and I'll show you a unit right here, right next to the porch, and there it is again. And the actual corner was just past that, and then to make a long story short, um, this, um, this was the corner that we ju had just found. We were able to uh, triangulate, basically, uh, from this corner, we also found this corner here. So what this ended up being was a uh, palisade about 180 feet by 140 feet. That's a whole lot bigger than anything that, that we had documented. Um, we also determined that this dated to the later fort because there were artifacts in the palisade trench and in the holes um, that the posts were in. And we only did sampling of that. We didn't do much excavating. It was just enough to identify it. Um, this was the map that we actually submitted to, to the DOT with our recommendation. And the green here are buildings that we suggested, just based on that preliminary testing, uh, were present, as well as potentially an, er an earlier uh, palisade line of some kind for the fort or perimeter line. And then, of course, with the outer, outer um, per perimeter. The DOT, <coughs> at the same time as we provided them with this information, made the determination that the, the new bridge would go just north of the present bridge, and that the new approach road would have to go right across here, just, just north of, of where um, the, the, the present approach road is. Um, they, it was the only thing they could do. It was going to be way too expensive for, the, for them to put it elsewhere. So that triggered um, a phase three, or data recovery as we call it in archaeology. So starting uh, last April, um, we, we began excavating um, in earnest. Um, this is a, one of the more, more unique findings. Um, this is an intaglio. Um, the image is a little strange, but um, there's an eye, a nose, a chin, um, and I think this is glass. They're often done in crystal, um, but there's, there's a bubble in it there. But <clears throat> in looking at this, um, it almost looks like it's a Native American portrait, because you see these things up on the top of the head that almost look like uh, feathers. And we haven't had time to do any research on it. Um, but that would have been set in a ring or, or pendant, you know, something, some kind of, de of jewel, decorative jewelry. Um, by the mi middle of April, uh, the rains came and kept coming, and um, it was, was not a lot of fun. Orman Hines there volunteering. Um, it was a real challenge. Um, now, returning to sort of the front edge of the yard, began clearing. Um, here we are exposing some of the uh, brick 
surface um, and in the background some of the cobble surface. Um, as time went on, I'll just, I'll, I want to point out here's the cobble surface and then there's a lar large area of brick surface here. We recognize that the cobbles and the brick came up to a point and stopped and there's a lot of open ground here. In between those areas was, was an in irregular uh, line of stones, large stones. <clears throat> Um, at the same time, there was another line of stones we were able to define here, and in this mess, there's a chimney uh, base, which you'll see in a moment. Um, a shallow cellar, root cellar here, great big piece of iron kettle in it, and there ended up being another cellar in this area. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm showing you lots of different features that we found as we were going, because we're scratching our heads and trying to figure out what all these different things relate to. Um, also, while we, while we were there, as we're, as we're working along, we found a, a nine-foot diameter cistern. Um, now, part of this was underneath the cobble pavement, okay? So the cistern was there earlier, got filled in, covered over, and then the co cobble pavement got put down, all right? This is just showing you, um, this is part of the fill in that uh, cistern. This is this red line here that actually kind of looks like um, a brick, and then this is the wall of the cistern. Um, they wanted that cistern to be as watertight as possible. So what they did, the fact that it was dug into pure clay, they built a huge fire inside it and essentially baked the walls. Um, so that instead of lining it, say, with brick or something and parging it, they just built a fire in it. Now, Ed Murphy, who's here tonight, uh, this is his area. In the road cut, we had initially noticed that there were some stones sticking out of the ground right in, right in the top of the road cut. We, were, we cleared off the this, this sod, identified a wall here. Um, very kindly, um, Ed Murphy took this on as his own little project um, and began uncovering and uh, removing uh, fill and uncovering these walls and following them out. And much to all of our astonishment, um, it ended up looking like this. We had no idea um, what he was going to find. All, so we have one wall here. There's a corner back here. What well, wall comes out, hit another corner, goes in, another corner and comes out, and then come, come, turns this way out toward the road. So it's like an L-shaped wall. Um, all of this was underneath cobble pavement. So again, thinking association, which is very important in archaeology, um, it's a cellar, a filled cellar that was then covered over. Um, in excavating the fill in that drain, which is from the early fort period, um, this is a, a fully grooved axe. Um, and so we have, do have some Native American remains from the site. Uh, we have some pottery, um, some flakes, and a, a few projectile points. Um, and this is a piece of of Wedgwood. Um, Wedgwood came up with that uh, gre a green um, coloration in about 1759. And this green, the, this is another piece of that green plate. And we were thinking, okay, well, it must be associated with the Parks family, even though the green plate is fairly early. Uh, the green plate also looked like it was practically brand new uh, when it was broken. Very little wear on it. Um, there's another, uh, another view of it. Um, it. This is the same green plate uh, that was found in Williamsburg um, at one of the tavern sites and, and dates right to that per period, about 1759. Um, another thing that was found in that deposit um, was what is called a winged cherub. Um, this is a, a religious icon, religious motif. A study was done back in the 70s um, very well-known grave study looking at the popularity of different um, religious motifs, icons on gravestones, um, starting with the death's head, the cherub, and then the urn and willow. And as you'll see, the cherub starts, its popularity begins right around 1760 um, and then goes to about 1800. Well, all of a sudden, we realize, well, here we have Jacob Bailey living at the site from 1761 to 1767. And so the plate that we found, the green plate, fits that beautifully. This um, winged cherub is certainly uh, curious you know, as to know why, why would anybody else other than a, a religious person have something like that. So the present hypothesis is that this deposit may actually be associated with uh, Jacob Bailey's tenure there. Um, the building that he was living in at uh, the fort may very well have been fairly close to this area. The building was gone where the cellar is, but he would have deposited his trash. It was just a close area to, to throw his trash down. 
Um, it's, and this is um, Jim Lehman just published a book on, on Jacob Bailey just quite recently. Um, on the east side of the house, on the river side, at one point we were working and we found an area of stones um, outside of the main fort area. Um, we were able to open the area up and you open it up even further, nice and dry as you can see there. Um, as a result, uh, we, we are interpreting this actually as the original garrison, 20, 1721 garrison. The, uh, we don't know if that garrison house was one story or two story. Um, I haven't had a chance to talk with um, a chimney expert Jer Jeremy Irons in the area. I want to see if he might have some ideas, uh, but it could, it could have been a you know, larger structure. We just don't know at this point. We may, ne may never know. So that was the garrison 1721. 1723, uh, the fort actually gets built. So the garrison is right in this area. There's a stone wall, that massive, a, a large stone wall, and we believe that it actually connects down to the stone wall that we got across the road that, that's built on top of the brickyard. So that makes the brickyard earlier. So the, they were probably making bricks for the first fort, and this is actually the perimeter wall of the, of the first fort. Now inside that, we have a drain, as I mentioned. We have a cistern, here, let me uh, focus in a little bit. The drain, cistern, um, here's um, Ed's, Ed's uh, cellar. Um, and then we have another cellar here that we've been excavating. We know that actually dates to the first fort period and the later fort. Um, this cellar, of course, was filled in. Um, potential for structures associated with all, with all of those remains. Uh, definitely a building here so that the cistern and the drain would have been underneath the floor. A separate structure here with the cellar. And then we haven't quite figured out how the structure worked here. So this is 17, basically 1723 to 1740. Uh, by 1740, all of that's torn down, filled in. Um, the fort gets expanded. Uh, um, this is our rough idea of uh, the second fort. Um, here's your cobble pavement, brick pavement. Um, this is a big, large central chimney. There's an opening right here, a stoop, that would have come right into the chimney where it should, based on the building practices from that time period. Next to that was probably a ramp going into the building. Um, the, long, the building that was there starting in 1740 to 1755, we believe looked very much like the building at Fort Western today uh, without the shingles on it. It would have been a lar large, long uh, log building with at least two central chimneys. We think uh, right at the end of the season we may have hit uh, the remains of a second um, central chimney, but we'll, we'll wait and find out. Um, and courtesy of Ed, a helicopter view of the end of the season. Um, I'll just point out that we still have quite an area to open up over here to uh, reveal more of the earlier fort and the later fort. Um, it's a uh, daunting task since we, instead of having, what, eight months that we've had before, we only have three. I also want to add that we've had a tremendous volunteer program. A number of, of people are here we're here tonight have been participating. Um, we're going to continue that and we'll send out an email uh, to people to get, try to get some pe more people to come out. Um, the DOT, unfortunately, they, they've now purchased the house. Um, it's going to be demolished um, unless the contractor, um, by hook or by crook, finds a, someone to take the house, to, to move it. Um, that was brought up at a meeting. I actually brought it up and, and um, got quite a few blank stares. And so there it seems to be very little interest in that. But it would, it's, the house is actually in quite good shape, um, and it would be, be nice to, to have it preserved. Um, the, the house, it's the original seven, um, 1891 house with the L. The back part is, is a newer addition. <laughs>